Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so uh, Steve and I are here from Hursley to talk about Project Zoe, and John's here as well. So if you... Now, one of the reasons... So I'm a developer, I'm a, I'm a software developer. One of the reasons I like coming to conferences is to validate with people that we're not doing anything really stupid. Um, because I've worked on projects that have had lots of promise and then failed, and I've worked on very small projects that have succeeded beyond their expectations, uh, generally through feedback from people. People say, stop doing something stupid, and have you thought about doing something to do with this? So I've got a little... Um, so, so I live at, near, in a, a town called Hursley, uh, near Winchester, actually. And in Winchester, there's a shopping centre. It's called the Brook Street Shopping Centre. And um, a little bit of background to the Brook Street Shopping Centre. It's on two storeys, and it's got a two-storey car park. So it's not like an, any other shopping centre you might find. Um, when they named the shopping centre, uh, stories, rather than calling it the ground floor and the first floor anyway, they called it lower shopping and upper shopping. Upper shopping is the first floor. If you're an American, it's the second floor. And you have lower parking and upper parking. So you always have your kind of up and down index knowing which floor to go to. And when my children were much younger, um, uh, we actually... Um, this is quite a lot younger. We're actually going into a lift or an elevator. This is an American. We are on the ground floor. They want to go to a toy store that's above them on the first floor, or American, the second floor. Okay, so they're walking into the lift, right? And you're presented with a series of buttons. And the buttons tell you to go to the upper shopping, the lower shopping, the upper parking, and the lower parking. And we're actually on the lower shopping floor. And my son pushes the button called up, mark upper parking. <laughs> and then the lift went down. And it was a hoot. And he used to go back all the time and... He's got various videos, and I think there's no who's that too. Anyway, if you do, and I, I know I often wonder how many people were involved in implementing such a stupid decision to create a <laughs> lift with a button called up that takes you down, which is actually, um, and I, had a, I have a friend who's blind, and actually it has in Braille the word up on it <laughs> as well. So it's just a, a poor decision at the start of a project can lead to something that is very hard to undo later on because it's sort of burned, burned into steel and stuff. So... So, that, so I don't want to do that, personally. I don't want to be mocked at in years to come for doing something really stupid. So a little bit of background history about Project Zoe that we now work on. Um, it was mentioned a little bit at the keynote at the start. And just, just to give you some um, um, background as to why it's important and why I'm, I'm quite pumped about it. I work for IBM. Um, we got together with Rocket, who are a very big uh, software company, and Computer Associates, who are an even bigger, vast uh, software company. Uh, with huge mainframe presence, and we created a project where all three of us got together, and we called it Project Giza, and we did it always with a vision to open source that project, and we've now open sourced that project. My background, um, I used to work on Eclipse, the Eclipse Foundation, uh, probably about 15 years ago, I was involved at the very start of that project, and I've worked on Java as an open source project. So open source is a really good mix to make something work really well. Okay. Um, it was launched at SHARE, which is a big mainframe conference since St. Louis in August and stuff. These are all important people. That's the reason I told you this slide. So this is like my vice president, this is Greg Locke, who's the vice president of Computer Associates. This is Andy Junos, who's the founder and vice president, um, and just an amazing guy. This is Rocket Stuff, this is Scott Murphy from the Open Project. I'm not just name dropping these people, but it's like these are big, important people from big, important companies, and they've kind of I was going to finish that sentence differently there, but I won't. Anyway, they've committed themselves to this project, so it will succeed. Um, um, I just, uh, uh, technically, it will look very different to what it does now, and I'm sure of, of that. We've already had some good feedback about stupid things we're doing. So this is quite big, um, that these vice presidents are committed to this project. The, the, the best part about this conference for me was that I actually met a guy who was 72 years old afterwards in the bar, and he told me that he was going to retire three years later than he wanted to, because he was so excited about this, he wanted to contribute all of this incredible macros and scripts and intellectual property that he'd, he'd created back to the open source community. His legacy was, was, was leaving it behind, and he'd always wanted to do this. So I was very pumped about that. Um, so everything we do is in the open. Um, we have Slack channels. People here know what Slack is or not? Anyway, anybody can sign up to Slack it's just an instant messenger. It's a pretty good instant messenger. And you can start chatting to people and you can see everything that we do. Nothing is done in secret, including the fact that these guys screwed up about a, a meeting agenda. I just grabbed a screenshot this morning. So if you want to know about, this is a channel that I monitor a lot. 
or Zoe onboarding, how to get started. If you download something and it balks on you, you go to the Zoe user channel, you just ask questions. And every, it's interesting, sometimes I'll log in a bit late because maybe I'm traveling or it's because of time zones and somebody else has answered the question for me. And that's quite cool. I'm not used to that as an IBMer. Normally if somebody has a problem, it comes down to just IBM answering it. And other people in the community answer. So it's kind of getting really quite good. And you can have private messages for people and you can put screenshots and video clips. And, and anyway, it's pretty good and you can see all about the differences. So, so please, if you want to know more about it, you don't have to be extending the code. You can just be sort of on the sidelines. You can join calls and look at the managers. Um, everything that we do is on GitHub, in the, in the github.com, Zoe, open source. All of our code, I say all of our code, it's like about 90% of our code. We're still in what we call an open beta phase. There's still a little bit of code we have to, we have to open source. Um, and the reason that we're a, bit, a little bit slow on open sourcing it is just because some of the code that we've got d depends on libraries that we're not allowed to open source. Uh, so we have to make it, you know, uh, get, get make, make sure the entire software stack is open source. Okay. So that's very cool. So I'm going to tell you about what's in it. But just if you just think about this, it's like it's, it's super big. Three massive companies, three huge vice presidents have, have gone and said that this is going to be the future. And it's all in the open. Okay. Just, and there's a stupid lift and elevator that goes up when you push down. Just remember these three things. Okay. So oh, um, I'll do a little bit of background because probably not everybody saw. Steve gave some of this. Time. I'm going to talk about the command line interface. What is the Zoe command line interface? Um, by the way, if you want me to drop and start doing demos at any point, let me know. But if I do demos, I might get. So the Zoe command line interface um, is a command line interface. And I, and I might actually do a demo, because I actually think a demo. Pic what did somebody say? A picture speaks a thousand words. A demo speaks a thousand pictures. Here we go. Um, can people see? Steve did some demos before, and it got very, um, oh, that's not the one I want to do. Here we are. So this is, uh, can people see that? I'll do a little control shift plus. Um, oops. I don't need to turn around and do that. So the command line interface, if, so this is my Mac, right? And if I want to do something on my Mac, I, I can issue commands. So I can just see where am I, you know, PWD, print working directory, and I can do, you know, change directories and fool around and do stuff with my, with my Mac. So what Zoe lets you do is it lets you do stuff with a mainframe through a command line interface. Um, there's a command called Zoe, and if you want to know what it does, you just type Zoe H, and it does help. The, um, I'm going to quickly show you Zoe profiles dash H, Zoe profiles list dash H. And I can connect to different systems, Zoe profiles list SMF profiles. Anyway. So I won't show you how to create these, these profiles, but I, mean, I have a profile for a system that, that Zoe knows about, which is called WinMBS27, and it's back in Hursley. So what I can do is I can connect to that profile, and I can start issuing commands against that. And some of the commands I can do, um, I've just got some in my history, just to make it a little bit quicker. I can list a bunch of data sets, and I can get it back and see. I can list all members from a data set. I can, um, what else can I do? I can issue commands. This is where it gets interesting. I can issue a, TS, um, a console command, display all address spaces, and I can grep it to get all of the master address spaces. Um, I, we have demoed the, the CLI for just hours on end, and I won't bore you, but you can do a ton of stuff. Um, I'm going to see if I can do something about jobs. I've, I've got that in my history, yeah. I can list all of my jobs, and I can list all of my jobs, and I can put prefix, you know. And the way that you would normally do this is you, you would have to log on to an interface on the mainframe. And you can do this through ISPF, ISPF 3.4 member list. Um, you can do this through IS, you know, uh, SPSS and log on to different parts. But you end up with a very, um, I wouldn't use the word hostile, but you end up with a, an interface that is not familiar to people who just like to issue um, Unix scripts. Um, now, Steve gave a demo of this yesterday, and he got quite a lot of flack from people saying, well, I can just log on to the mainframe, and I can do this for USS. You can't, by the way. You can't log on to USS and get data sets and submit jobs. So it's still fairly limited to the Unix file system. You can't log on to USS on the mainframe and issue TSM and console commands. 
But where it gets interesting for me, if I do PWD, which is Print Working Directory, so I'm in my GSE 2018 folder, which is right here. I'll see if I can do a little party trick here. So if I wanted to edit a file, so I have a data set called uh, copy job. I can see it, winchday.copyjob. I'm just going to say Zoe. Um, actually, I'm going to do, do, do Zoe H. I'm going to, so I always forget how to run commands. So I know I've got a command called Zoe files. That's H, Zoe files. I've got something called download, DL, H, Zoe files, DL, DS. You see what I'm doing here is, is I'm, I'm kind of saying, I'm entering like, the first part of the command and saying what have I got next and the second part and the, kind of like content assisting effectively if you're used to that so I'm going to download the data set um, and then I'm going to put the actual I think it's winchj.jcl copy I think it was called there we go and it downloaded that data set let me just get that thing so what's interesting about that is you might think well that's that's not particularly interesting I'm actually just going to open up with Visual Studio um, what it means I can do with that data set is I can effectively, well, I've kind of jumped the gun a little bit on stuff I was going to show you. I can, I can edit that with my favorite editor. So I might have Atom, I might have, um, here I've got Visual Studio Code, I might have IntelliJ, I might have Notepad. It doesn't really matter. In fact, perhaps it would have been a better example if I'd edited that with Notepad. Um, open with. Chris and Chris, yeah. What's it doing with code pages? Is it moving to page? Yeah, so it's a good question, Chris. So it's in code page conversion. Uh, so that file will be stored in Obsidian, it, and it's converting it to UTF-8, yeah, across the wire. So can you then, if you can change this locally, then push it back, and it will, what's the... I yeah. know that literally pushing around it. He's seen my demos yeah. before, yeah. Can you put it again and ask you another question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course you can, of course you can, Chris. That's fine, that's fine, of course you can. So I'm just going to make a quick, so I'm going to change the name of that job to be GSE 2018 or something like that, yeah? And I'm going to save my job. Now that job has been saved back into my local file system. Okay, and you're absolutely right. So, so I've saved that locally in my local file system. I can now push that back or I can submit that directly. I could do that if you guys are interested watching me do that. I can do that for you. Um, no, 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 not at all. So Zoe... Um, I think it's jobs, isn't it? It must be. Uh, Zoe jobs. Zoe jobs sub. Oh, actually, no, I didn't need to. Zoe jobs sub contained in a local file which is called slash, what was it called? Winchj slash jcl slash copy.txt. And I, I want that. Leading slash, yeah. So let's give it a go. Oh, look, man. There we go. So, so what I did there, and that's a little bit of a kind of like, you know, don't, don't, you know, what's the man behind the curtain? That's exactly what I was doing there, Chris. So that job that is, that JCL that's in my file, I mean, I didn't need to retrieve it and edit it. I just wanted to show you. So if I'm, if I'm working with a ton of scripts that are off platform, perhaps they're in Git or something like that, or perhaps they're just whatever, right, I can basically just start punching the mainframe and just saying, you know, submit, it. this is JCL, do something for me, build something from this. I don't need to have all of this information to host it in the data set. So the scenario I showed you was quite a contrived one where I was actually getting it and editing it locally. But basically, I'm editing this locally off the mainframe using my familiar editor, submitting it to the mainframe, and I can see my job. And I could do more on this. I mean, I can go into my job, and I can start manipulating my job more. Um, what's... <laughs> But I was doing a data set. But yes, if it's encoded, yeah, it, it, we, we take care of encoding and stuff like that. The answer is yes, we do it. One quick thing I was going to show you. Now, the, for the command line interface, um, I wanted to show you some plugins. So what I, did, what I did there was I actually had to get the file, fiddle about with it in Visual Studio, and then I had to manually push it back outside. Now, within, uh, it's this one here, yeah, there's an extension to Visual Studio code. And you can install the extension for Visual Studio Code. Okay, I'm not going to do it. I've, I've, I've done it already. 
And with the extension of Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio Code, for people who know Visual Studio, it just lets you edit the file system. You can add directly data sets. So I've added directly those data sets. And if I go and look at my um, data set, well, I didn't actually push that file back. That file was still left on my local file system. I haven't actually pushed that one back. But what it lets you do is it affect, and, and th this effectively lets you, maybe I'll go and just change this one directly and call this GSC 2018, because at some point I'm going to log on to the mainframe and actually show it to you. And there's also a plugin for, for highlighting JCL. Visual Studio Code is an open source thing. So what you're doing is we're bringing, we're bringing familiar tools, and there, there can be plugins for other things as well. We're bringing familiar tools that non-mainframers are already comfortable with, as many of them from open source as possible, and we're basically blending those with the mainframe. Yeah? And if we do that and just get that mix of soup right, that's going to make the mainframe look more attractive and appealing and a little bit less hostile. Uh, I use the word hostile again, second time. Sorry, I have to edit the video. Because mainframe is not hostile. It's a very powerful runtime environment. <laughs> <laughs> that's secure and massively scalable, etc. Yeah, and so forth. But, but as an environment to work with, it's still... I remember, you know, I'm 52. I first came to the mainframe, I think, when I was 40. I still found it a little, a little jarred with me comp compared with some of the sort of, you know, the IDEs and the, and the things that were out there at the time. And, uh, and that's really the, the sort of power of once you start building things from the bottom up, you can end up building things like this. And this can get better and better. And I mean, I mean and this is already, I mean, we can, I can do a few things in here, like I can create a new member and delete a PDF and stuff. But, you know, Come back in a few months' time, we'll be submitting jobs. We'll be, you know, this will be like a jazz school, and I think somebody's over it. Anyway, so, so this is really the power of blending those two things together. That's what I... So it's probably just worth mentioning. The CLI is just a Node NPM package. It's built in a bunch of TypeScript. So the VS Code plugin, which, again, is on GitHub, you can look at it. It's using that same TypeScript to pull it. So we've, we've got a pipe into the mainframe from distributed, and we're just using it by a command line or by a VS code exactly the same way, rather than having to go, oh, we'll write something different, we'll go over yeah. FTP or something like that. We've just gone, we've got, this is our conduit, let's just use it and build more stuff on the top. Right. And the person who wrote the plugin for Visual Studio didn't know squiddly squat about the mainframe. He just knew that there was a CLI and that was it, right? He could have been talking to a Unix machine. Well, I mean, knew that there was TypeScript. Yeah, he knew there was a TypeScript library available. And that's really nice. So, you, And you do end up seeing a very generational thing. You see the over 45-year-olds who understand. Chris is under 45, possibly. Anyway, I'll give you the benefit of the data. Chris is very clever. Chris understands the mainframe. He's, he's, he's unique. But you do end up seeing sometimes, you know, the younger person understands TypeScript. And there's a few Steve's as well, kind of like on that. That's, anyway, so, so sometimes you get people who are sort of, it's like when my kids, I've got, I've got two children, and when the first one, stopped speaking baby talk and started speaking English, and then the other one was still speaking baby talk. I said, well, can you translate? You know, what are they saying? Do, you know, are they hungry? Do they need, you know, is the milk too warm? You know, Wah. Anyway, so, so sometimes you find these mainframers who've, st who've still got that, and Matty's there as well. He's grinning anyway. Anyway, so I didn't want to insult anybody, so apologies for people who have insulted. Um, this is another interesting thing that Steve showed a much more detailed demo of yesterday. So again, if you, with all of these scripts, you can do lots of automation. So this is actually a very cool automated script. And if you look at it, it's just a standard Unix shell script. And it's, it's doing a bunch of Steve stuff, and he's looking at data sets, and then he's using JQ, which is a, um, a TypeScript library to, what, to, to pass yeah, JSON response to. So he's basically saying if a data set already exists, he's doing a little bit of cleanup, delete it. Look at this Zos, Zoe Zos files, create data set classic. Then he's piping in the standard, and he's piping in basically a bunch of JCL. Right, which you could construct, you could be like a DevOps pipeline and just constructing this thing on the fly, just grabbing environment variables from, you know, here left and right left and center, then you're submitting it, um, you know, basically running it, uh, spinning around in a loop, checking the status, checking when it goes to output status and getting the reply and doing it and stuff. And when Steve runs it, because he's much better at it, then you can see it actually works and log stuff like that. So that's just again to show you the power, again, that somebody who wants to do some automation on the mainframe and understands Unix, and you know, he's got JQ libraries, and um, I did that little thing with grep where I was you know, running scripts and grep. So you can do all of that stuff, right? You're not logging onto the mainframe, you're in your shell environment, and, and you're just chatting, having a chatty you know, conversation with the mainframe. So that's cool. And I sort of demoed this already, but I was gonna show the non-prescriptive 
you know, I've worked, I worked on this project, I'm so very uh, proud of this project when we kind of like brought this sort of whole eclipse development environment to the mainframe, so we, we made it work with data sets and things like that, as opposed to having to go to the, I'm not going to swear, I'll tell them again, anyway, this um, possibly less user-friendly environment. Um, but again, with Visual Studio Code, these are just screenshots in case my demo completely balked. Um, you know, we can, we can bring the modern IDE to the mainframe with this pipe for the CI. But the parents can now pick and choose what you, what you use for what? And we're not being pushed, absolutely. So, and, and I won't tell the customer by name, but we have a very large, probably, anyway, we have very large banks who come along and they say, well, the problem that they've got when they hire people is, is somebody will come into the mainframe shop and if they say, well, your choice is that or that, you know, be like, well, that's a little bit old, and even that's a little bit old now, to be honest. Um, and they come along and they go, like, you know, I came out of university, I've learned Atom, I've learned whatever. Somebody, I, and it's not, it's somebody, some people come out of university and they say, I like Vim and VI. I mean, this is not, I don't really care. <laughs> I don't really care. All I care about, all, all we care about, is that you find the mainframe a comfortable environment to work with. So you bring, you bring, and you don't have to hire a big bank and they go, you're going to use this, you know, and they just kind of lock you in a room. You, you saw all those kids yesterday at the, uh, was it Tuesday, the, when Meredith was saying, how did you work with the mainframe? And they were like, I was tricked. You know, <laughs> I was tricked. I was told I'd be working with enterprise, large scale computing, and all of a sudden I was locked in a dungeon <laughs> with a lot of kind of, you know, um, I was just about to say, say something else really <laughs> rude um, but I won't. Anyway, I felt, anyway, so, but, but, you know, and eventually I, so, so you're absolutely right. I don't care if you're using Vim or whatever, right, or, or VI, or, or you even make your own editor, right? Uh, you know, just knock yourself out, right? But you, you, you have to have the transition between that and that. Okay. Does any of that make any sense? Yeah. That's what we're trying to do. And if you guys keep tracking the project, we will, we will succeed. We will do that. We have the people <coughs> working to do that. Um, so let's talk about REST API, anatomy of Zoe. Does anybody want to see? So Zoe has three, three parts of it. We have this, the main uh, the command interface, which is actually very, very cool. Um, we have an API mediation layer that we're going to talk about, and we have a web desktop. I have an order that I was going to talk about those. Does anybody want to? Are people more interested in using Zoe or extending Zoe? What's the? This is like one of those books where you get to, where it's like someone's just walked into a, a room. You know, do they open the door on the left and the door on the right? Or should I just carry on? Personally using it. Okay, cool. Well, we'll, hit, we'll hit using it. So we'll hit using it before we do. So what I'm going to do when it comes to using it is I'm going to demo the two other parts. Um, so the other part that we have. So installing Zoe is, I'm just going to use Firefox, for example. Um, so the other two interesting thing about using Zoe, when you download it and install it, it should install in about 10 minutes or less, but that, that's what we try to do. Um, if not, you know where to find me. You go to Slack and you just hit me. You can even hit me by my name directly. If you, trust, if, if you have a prerequisite, <coughs> which is primarily no and bottom F, then, and you've got an account with some posts. Yeah, the main thing is a fairly locked down environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I'm just going to reload. So we, we have the command line interface. The other thing that we wanted to do was when you go to lots of mainframe shops, they tend to have, they tend to be dual monitors. Do I have to stay on page or leave page? Yeah, I'm just going to work out why it's not, not refresh. We have a desktop. So lots of customers, lots of big banks and things, they actually, they have laptops and then they have the mainframe and they have a lot of tools that run in the middle that require a PC. They require a sort of Intel machine. So they, Either they install those onto the laptop, which creates a problem. Like this is massive sort of client server problem that you've got, is if you've got a server and every client has to have a thing on it that can talk to the server, you've got this massive latency problem. It's a bit like sort of painting the fourth bridge in, in Scotland, right? Is that every desktop's got the right version and then like you've got to update it and it, it's very, very messy. So it's much better to have a zero install client that just runs in a browser. If you look at Fang, like Facebook, Apple, uh, Facebook, Amazon, sorry, Netflix, and Google are four companies. That, you know, they're massive companies right now, and they just they made all their money on, on, on the internet. Right? I think you can get. No, I haven't. I might just go and run in this one. Run in Chrome. 
So we, we, we provide a desktop that the idea behind the desktop is it, is, it is dead on me, isn't it? It'll run, okay. So you, I'm logging on to a mainframe through a browser. And what we wanted to do here was provide the ability for different applications, different mainframe applications. And you could run this full screen. And I've forgotten there's a keystroke I can use to run it, make it full screen. So I don't have to be running it in a browser. Now within, the, within this, we provide a set of, I would, of, of GUI applications. Um, so we provide, I was fooling around with files earlier. Um, and I'll just, so I've got a file here. So it might be a bit small at the back, anyway. But, but if I, so Visual Studio Code is cool, but I'm running it on my laptop and I'm fooling around with mainframe files. It just makes sense for me to be able to just run directly in the browser. And I can just maximize this and just knock myself out. I could just spend my entire day, if my entire day was just editing mainframe files. I could just do this and I've got, you know, content assist and, you know, I've got various sort of things that make it interesting for me to do. Um, I'm just gonna quickly see, if I wanted to submit that, I did the submit job earlier. I can just right mouse click it and it will say submit the job. And m actually maybe I'll change the name of it. I'll do my GSE 2018. I'm determined to get a job appearing that's got the word GSE in it. Um, this particular file actually just copies that. So if I run it, it must have failed actually. And now I can go and look at Jazz Explorer. So you can do this. You can do this using other ways. Logging onto a mainframe. Oh no, there. Look, it actually worked. GSE. Oh, well, it bended. Yeah. Data set must not be there or something. Where did it bend? Is that a GDL error? Was it? There we go. It's security access. It's because I'm actually logged. Yeah. Okay. The data set that I'm copying, I don't have authority to open. Right, yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, that was good. I was just like wondering a little bit. You just saw me just sort of like diving, diving under the clouds there. So just pull me back up. So forget the fact it didn't work, because it sort of did work in the way that I was just able to do this all in a browser. So if you want to share this information with other people as well, all they need is a browser. And I've got a VPN, so I'm connected to my mainframe, and they can do that. You don't need anything else to install. Now, again, if I was doing a longer demo, what I would do is I would launch this. This is the old non-hostile mainframe interface, just in case I've got a web. Well, this thing's really going south. Anyway, there is, a, there is a, a green screen application I can use. Well, I can use this as well if I wanted to. I can, I can log on through this and fiddle about with a interface that was built probably before I was born. Um, and, or I can do this, right? And this running in a browser is actually cool. Steve, Steve demoed some quite interesting stuff the other day that was cool. Um, I'm just going to refresh this page because it's gone south. There's some problem to do with the network latency. Um, so running in the browser is cool. Why has this gone south? I don't know what happened to me. Let's assume that, that I wanted to fix that, <coughs> fix that file and I wanted to talk to Mike over there. What I can do is I can send Mike, and I'm just going to do, now this is, I can, I can send Mike that URL. I can just email it to him and go, you know what, Mike, I, I just don't know what's going wrong. I tried to get this file working and I can't get it working. Help me out here. And then I can just send it and, and Mike can just go ahead, go to his URL, sign on. So I'll do winch. And um, see my file, right? So, so, when, so when you think about the web, so like my, my sister has got two children and my two nieces and when they have a birthday now, she just sends emails out and saying, oh, you know, she wants this scarf or she wants this whatever it is, she wants this DVD or something. Um, and I just click a link and it takes me straight to the shopping site and I just add it to cart and it's all taken care of. And, th and we need the same metaphor as well when we're dealing with the mainframe as well so that we don't have to say to people, work with this file or look at this log or do something. You can just share that information. 
And again, that's something that we're trying to do with Adobe as well. So even though we have this desktop with all of these things that you can log onto and just launch, you can come flying in on any kind of attack vector, really, to say, I want, I want that thing, and I want to share that thing and work with that thing. So we have some customers who a uh, while back were saying, this is very cool because they create help tickets, and they want to be able to send the help tickets. So somebody's looking at a log, and they say, you know, this looks a bit iffy here, and they can create the help ticket in I, you know, Jira, I think it was this particular customer that's built by Atlassian. Um, and then they could basically, somebody else could go in later and, and click it, and then boom, and then they're right there. And then they can go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the guy who can fix that, or the girl who can fix that. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we're doing with, again, advantage. And that comes to Mike's point about zero install clients. That help for a little bit of the kind of demo stuff that we're going towards. So what's, what's interesting, um, I've got, I'm trying to work out where I am in my incognito browser. Uh, I need to go back to here. Um, what I was going to sort of, and for extending, is that there are other people. We've got a bunch of apps that we ship with, and we're trying to get other people to sort of extend the type of apps that we have within here. The other thing, as well as the stick on demos, is APIs. So people here know what REST APIs are or not? Or you do? OK. I will, and Swagger. So this is, so, so REST APIs are, you know, APIs I can call, and Swagger is a, the documentation for those APIs. Just keep an eye on my time. Um, so this is the set of APIs. So I've been, so what Swagger does is, oh, I've got one already running now. Um, I'm just going to change it to be, no, I'll just do TFT or Adam. Um, so when I'm listing a, a bunch of data sets, if I, you know, it, it's effectively like if you go into a library and you want to find a bunch of books, you'll go to like a sort of index, you know, and then look up in the index, and the index will say, okay, that book's on that shelf, and, and here's how to perhaps see a little map about how to get there. It gives you that. So everything that you want to do, um, so if I want to get a list of me members, tstradam.jcl. Uh, am I? That's okay. Sorry, Steve and I were doing some stuff earlier. Okay, so if, if I... If you don't want to demonstrate that it is secure, there's no cutting through RAPF or anything like that. So everything, so there's no secret source. So, so when the project, I've worked on projects beforehand where customers have come to us and they've said, you know, this is great, but I want to add this new feature. And for us to do that at IBM, it takes, it takes several months for us to kind of get that and put that into our backlog and deliver that to customers. But now, like every layer of the application is, is available for people to use. So the APIs, so if you don't like a particular feature, you can just do the APIs and just roll your own. And we've got lots of samples, and I'll try and show some of those later, where what we're trying to encourage is for people, is, is it JFK? You said, like, ask not what you can do for your country, but... He asked it the other way around, anyway. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Um, so, if, so people come along and they say, well, I, I need to build this, this app. And what you've got is kind of like 80% of the way there. We'll, we'll be like, well, knock yourself out. You know, all the APIs are there. All the source code is there. You can, you can use these and just roll your own. Uh, you know, take out the bits you don't like, add in the new bits that you want to. So everything is backed by REST APIs. Um, and the REST APIs being defined by Swagger, is a, is, is a good thing. So everything that I just did there for that little de demo, I could do, but I'm looking at, I'm like, I could do here. So um, I can go and get a list of data set members. Um, is the command line interface Brian with API? Really yes. Good. Yeah, it's a good question, Chris. So the command line interface, so you've got GUI at the top, right? <laughs> Effectively, the GUI, yes, the command line interface does drive the REST APIs. And I was going to talk about some more advanced things like API mediation and, and having an API gateway and things like that that make it all hang together, make it run at scale. But Chris is absolutely right. And there is a pretty picture somewhere um, yeah, that so basically shows that. A little bit in the technical weeds. So as part of the open source contribution is a framework called Imperative. And Imperative basically allows you to take commands and convert them into REST APIs. So that's what the Imperative part does it. And then the so we see how it built on top of that and defines it for our base example. So yeah. If I wanted to extend it, I made the code changes so that I've changed, I've, I've added a new REST API endpoint or something. And then at that point, I can then get the command line interface and just say, oh, try this new endpoint. Yeah, that, that's, what, that's what we believe in, is that 
all of it in one place rather than end up pushing, oh, well, you've got bits of special sauce in the clients and bits of special sauce in um, the web. Let's get it all down on the platform and close to the data and accessible by everyone. Yeah. So the advantage of Swagger, if you didn't so did know what Swagger, so you can have a lot of APIs, but unless you catalog them all, you don't know what they've got. So this API here, for example, when you run this Swagger, you can see the parameters, and you think, okay, now I know Wink.data.dataset, that's just the dataset name, and it, it generates the actual URL that you need to access it, and it also runs it as well, which is quite cute, so you can see my, 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 my thing here. But if I want to start using that from somewhere else, I mean, a GET request, I can just punch directly into a browser, into a web browser, you know. So you can you can aggregate these with another other things. I will um, actually, if we're on the topic of APIs, I'll go I'll go a little bit further forward. Slide show, play some current slide. So the kind of why do I care about APIs? Um, so these a APIs plus Swagger gives you a single place to look at and say, well, here are all the things I can do. You can click them, you can try them out. You can see all the parameters and you can do stuff. And it's interesting, you can do several things with those. You can build user interfaces. So this is a user interface that is looking at a log and it's, uh, you know, it scrolls and it looks at the contents of the log and things like that. And that was cute. And we built that, I don't know, like a year ago, a year and a half ago or something. And we were showing this to, um, to some customers. And someone said, well, what do you do with the log? And I said, well, what I actually do with the log is I look at the log and I see something weird in there. Um, or I'm, I am looking for a particular thing that says, you know, sums up, or something bad appears, like something sort of toxic appears in the log, and then they have to take care of it. And, um, and then what you do, well then what they then might do is contact somebody else. You know, and that's how sort of IT de departments work. You know, I might be a developer, has, has written something that's really going to balk it because there's something quite toxic in the log. Or it might be that something good appears in the log that successfully means that something's occurred. And then, Coming back to Slack, I was showing Slack as instant messenger. We thought, well, this would be cute. So we had some people who built this project. <coughs> and what they did was they built a plugin. Slack's written in Node, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, they built a plugin for the chat client. So the chat client I showed you earlier was me chatting with humans, right? Um, and the, the, the chat client that they built was basically, could you have it such that the, your, your chat client is effectively monitoring the log for you? So you're sitting in your familiar environment, right? That's the problem with working with the mainframe or anything. If you have to have this very choppy experience where you're logging into different interfaces, you end up with two screens. It's like Swordfish or the Matrix or something. You, know, you end up with loads of screens and it just becomes really overwhelming. You know, you're chatting with somebody about where you're going to get to lunch or something and all of a sudden goes, uh-oh, one of your jobs balked, right? Because your chat client is talking to your, to, to your log, polling it and stuff. And you've just got this like, this is the interface by which people chat. The mainframe does stuff in logs, you know, people sit in the middle and, and try and contact, and, you know, just, just put some, you go quite a good thing, you're talking about chat, chat bots the other day, I mean, bring, bring the environment that people are comfortable with to this, and again, this particular one, and the developers that wrote this, I think they were just interns, weren't they? Yeah, they knew squiddly squat about the mainframe again, right, they just go, oh, a bunch of APIs, cool, you know, spec it and work it out, and, and then you can see something bad happened, or, in this particular case, this is just particular, you know, this particular user, their jobs are finished, and then they're, yeah, they're chatting about where they're going to go for lunch or whatever it is with their friends or perhaps dealing with something, and then something goes, oh, your job's finished. Like, oh, okay. And then within chat clients as well, you can share files with each other. So you can upload pictures of like, you know, shopping lists or menus for where you're going to go for lunch or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and again, this can then share the files that you would need to. So you can then click here and then directly within the chat client, you can see the files that again have come off the mainframe. So it's just a whole, it's just a different way of thinking. So it's, it's not Visual Studio Code for developers, but it's just how, can I, how, how is my day-to-day -day interaction with the mainframe occurring? You know, you're chatting to it and it's chatting to you. Does that make sense? I don't know if that was really, I didn't want to sort of oversell it, but it's just, but, and, and these are the sort of things that we really want Zoe to do, and that's why we're doing, we're focusing massively on the plumbing at the moment, because if we get the plumbing right, then, then, then this follows, right? This is, these are the kind of, like, the people that follow up behind the dollars. You have a question? Yeah. Talking about the, the, the plumbing there, is that doing something really nice, like using the real-time or log logstream API in a way to get to a session dentistry, or is that just basically reloading the end 
it's the reloading the end of the log every so often. Thanks for just popping my bubble there. But hey-ho, we're an open source project. So, so, so please, sign up. So yeah. I think yeah. it's it's look, it was utilizing WebSockets, yeah, we're using which WebSockets. is a yeah. technology, but under the cover on the mainframe, the other end of the WebSockets was just reloading it. Yeah, we were. So. Yeah, because we were. But you're right. I mean, to, I mean, obviously, you need to run this stuff out there. If people think it's cool and they want to run it at scale, then you talk, and then you could, oh gosh, I mean, you could, we could stick Watson in between the middle. I mean, we could really knock ourselves out. We could, we could have a field day, but, but this is not, at the moment, in this kind of growth of our project right now, we don't want to make one thing brilliant. You know, it's like a garden. We just want everything to kind of like, you know, we want to share the sort of water and fertilizer equally. Maybe that was a bad analogy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, and, and there were other ones as well. So this is another one. This is the same API where somebody built an app uh, on an Android phone, and it was just looking at logs. And the advantage of a phone, right, is the phone already connects you to, to other people. You can call other people. And uh, this was just able to basically get the log and, uh, you know, text it to other people, right? So the interface that, that you're comfortable with at the moment, whatever that is, whether it's an ID or a phone or a chat client or something, bring the mainframe into that world. By somebody who is skilled at developing for this interface, but not the mainframe. And that's what CLIs and APIs, REST APIs do. Yeah. And if we, if we get that right, and then we can make them brilliant and run at scale and stuff like that, because we're mainframers and we can do that well. But to start with, we just have to kind of mate with this community. That was a really bad analogy. Anyway. Does that help or not? Okay. So when you see Zoe, like, don't think, oh my gosh, this is like a completely closed list of stuff I can do. It's just there's just a few things out there. We're just kind of throwing, we're kind of going a bit wide, really. We're kind of like a, just like spinning around 360 degrees, just planting different things in different places and seeing what's going to happen. So I talk about API mediation layer. People interested about API mediation layer? Okay, there's at least one of them. Why do I care about API mediation layer? How do we do this thing at scale? So API mediation is interesting, and I'm going to geek out a little bit. So, so I've been building client server applications for probably most of my computing life. Since 15 minutes to go. Thanks, Keith. Right on schedule. Um, uh, so, so, so generally client-server computing is like, you know, you, you, you're running something interesting, like maybe it's got a GUI or it's, it's on my laptop, so I've got, you know, I've got a local file system or I've got my screen or, you know, I'm interacting with that and then I'm connecting to a server that's doing something interesting behind it. And the problem that we've always had with um, building client-server interfaces at scale, is if, if your next client is, is talking to its server, and then the next client is talking to its server, and its server, and its, its server, it doesn't scale very well. It becomes very choppy. If your job, if your scenario, is to cross-cut between different servers. So on the mainframe, you have lots of different servers running, lots of different address spaces, lots of different servers. And if you're trying to get your job done, you've probably got lots of servers running off the mainframe as well to actually get your job done, because sometimes data is taken off the mainframe to do things. And Linux on it. So the state of the art, um, the problem that you have when you connect all of these together is you end up with um, you end up with something that looks a little bit like this. And this is the project that I used to work on, and I sort of still do work on. This is Eclipse, but you end up with everybody when you when you add lots of plugins into your client to talk to lots of different servers. You end up with your experience. It's a bit like having a, a television where you just add new channels. You know, it's, you've got the advantage of the fact that you've only got one TV in your living room, but you can't watch two channels at once. You, know, you switch to this channel, and you switch to that channel. And often, and this is a, a <coughs> often as you, you know, you have to re-authenticate to each server that you connect to. Um, and that's bad if you've got things like multi-factor authentication and one-time use passwords and things like that, because a password is like a massive attack vector because people get bored with, um, you know, people reuse the same password in multiple places, and then it, the, the, the weakest place it will be stolen from, um, and then it's used to attack the strongest place. I mean, that's how the, um, you know, that's how, that, that's how Hillary Clinton's emails got hacked. I mean, it's, it's you know, um, and everything, and, and, and most, most sort of security threats are basically through, you know, password reuse being stolen, the weakest password being stolen, possibly by somebody malicious who sort of fished and, and trolled, trolled you into giving them to them. And then they'll lead it to attack somewhere that's, that's actually quite strong. So, mul so multi-factor authentication, one-time use passwords, they all protect against that because that weak password can't be 
get, you know, can't be used for the fun fact. Anyway, um, you also end up with, um, if you write a uh, desktop application like a GUI and you're, and you're connecting to multiple backends, it's quite hard to do advanced JavaScript because you end up with cores, what called um, cross-origin references, a cross-site certificate problem, because JavaScript, if, if you look at a browser, right, they have a little thing at the top, this is that's the, where it's signed from, it can only actually access, the JavaScript can only access the, the site that it was initially signed from. So if your web page tries to do, go to JavaScript, tries to go somewhere else and access, um, it can't do that. Um, otherwise that would be bad, but you could be in your Lloyd banking, I'm pick on Lloyd's, but I happen to be a Lloyd's customer, but you could be in your banking application and some little advert, you know, it could be like, you know, reading the JavaScript that actually told you information about your account and there's lots of different attack vectors. So you want to be served from a single origin. So, so, th so this is a problem here, right? It's because you can't, if you're not served from a single origin. Also certificates, if these are presenting different certificates, it gets messy. So that's what an API mediation layer does. So you need something that sits in the middle, big, a big fat, fat thing that sits in the middle. And what it effectively gives you is it gives you single sign-on, it gives you a single certificate, and it solves the um, cross out system. Does that help at all to back up? So that's why API mediation and API catalogs are, diff are interesting. And that's what Zoe's got. So Zoe has an API mediation layer. So the idea behind Zoe is that everything comes through a single port, a single host and a single port. But behind that, it's a bit like a sort of a swan, really. It looks pretty on the outside, but underneath there's all sorts of stuff going on. But underneath that, what that does is that binds together all those different backends. So it's not good enough if you just, if you just connect to one backend that can do something. If you're onboarding and you've got a different backend, those need to come through the same funnel. Does that make sense? The room's gone quiet, Keith. You said you're going to do something when the room went quiet. You're going to... No. Okay, no worries. So I'll do, do a little bit more into extending. I'm just going to go back more. So for people who want to extend, the pattern that we... And this is more for like somebody who wants to extend it. So the first thing... I showed a bit of a command line interface to do a bunch of stuff. It's also math. Most people who want to extend Zoe, one of the patterns is that they've got, their, an, ex they've got their exi an existing server somewhere out there that does something. It might help to debug something, <coughs> it might provide some, some service, and it's probably installed on, their, on, their, on, on a portion of their, of their customers' machines, and what they want to do is make that more consumable, blend it into the rest of the Zoe environment, benefit from it, and hopefully you know, grow their market share as well at the same time. So we're very interested in attracting those sorts of people. And there's different, the first way that you would want to do that is you would probably want to provide a command line interface to your server, right? So that people can just ping your server and go, is it there, is it up, is it down, how fast is it running? You know, just as the, I showed with files, you can bring files and edit them in Visual Studio Code, whatever that person's server is, if it's a debugger or something, they might want to stop it and start it and stuff. They want to provide a command line interface. And there are tutorials, and I've just, Included these for the benefit of, of um, you know, people reading muffins. But there are tutorials you can go in, and we've got some fairly rich tutorials called How to Develop for the Zoe Command Line Interface. And there's a sample of where you can plug in a sample, and the sample basically um, it actually just lists the contents of your directory. It doesn't connect directly to a server. And then this is the output of it. Is anybody interested in how to build this sample, or how to do TypeScript, or? How to do TypeScript command handlers? So can you all like regenerate your own command line from your own REST API? Absolutely, you absolutely can. So that's a good question. So, so if you remember the list of commands that I did at the start when I did Zoe H, I had them down to here. Plus so MF. What you would as as a what we want people to do is when they type the word Zoe, it comes up and it goes, "This is our Zoe CLI sample. This is our plugin." But it would come up and it would say at me company dot, you know, my company dot my stuff. Perhaps not so company branded directly, but, but you know, um, I can interact with OSMS, I can interact with my monitoring tool, I can interact with my debugging tool, I can interact with my profiling tool, you know. So that's what we want to get. So we want to have one way to log on to the mainframe. And what we want to do, we've also got what we call a discovery service as well, and that, that needs to be as, as dynamic as possible, so that just the fact that those 
products are installed on the system, this will grow because there's a very rich ecosystem of software <coughs> vendors out there. Um, and Zoe's open source. So even though I work for IBM and I'm paid by IBM, I'm, I'm not, I don't favor IBM in any single base. In fact, I have to deliberately defavor them. Um, sorry, guys, but sorry to associate with me. No, I mean, not, not deliberately, but in, a, in a, just a very just equal way. Um, so I will promote anybody else's debugger as, as much as IBM's debugger, for example, or anybody's profiling tool as much as IBM's profiling tool. It's a, it's a very equal rate. And that's what we want to do. So if you come back in a year's time, I expect this to have a lot more stuff on there. Um, I know uh, Computer Associates, for example, uh, they have a product called Brightside, and you can interact with they have a product called FileMaster Plus and their Endeavor, which is great. Five minutes ago. Thanks, Keith. So that's what we're trying to... In future, we'd love to have a much smarter thing so it could just connect to your API gateway and go, ah, you've got these services, let's find you the right plugin for that. But that's, that's, that's the dream rather than the reality at the moment. So if we have our own REST API already yep. with existing services, can we use this um, as an imperative tool? Or do we have yeah, to have special go back to that, that screenshot to be a special one. This one. Yeah, you go up <coughs> one more. Yeah, so basically you have to provide a list which says these are my command definitions, but then basically you have what's called a command definition and a handler. So the command definition shows you the, the command, so like directory contents was the one Joe used, and you put your description in there, and then it links to a handler, and this is the handler. So this is all we've pulled it in. You can see I command definition comes from bright side imperative. Um, using the imperative framework, and then you just have certain interfaces, so processing here, so this one is just basically saying, well, at the bottom it's doing files, this is the TypeScript, and mm -hmm. library.list directory contents directory. So you just sort of, there's three simple files that you have to add to. Um, this is... Sorry, oh, sorry. Sorry. Where do they plug, just to be clear, where do they plug in their APIs into this? I didn't quite get so that. in... So in here, this is just the TypeScript file. So imperative is the framework, and you put that in there. There isn't an API in this one. This is just this basic so sample. It's handle. just the local one. Yeah, 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 would, yeah. So if you go to the next one. So yeah, so this is the, the next sample, work sample, which is, shows you diffs of data sets. You can see in here, we've got our handler again, which is just calling data set diff dot diff passing a session through. So I think if you go to the next slide, we've got that. So this is data set diff handler, and this, again, this is using the ZOSMF um, files that they have here in the call right side to get access to download. So we're doing download.dataset, pass a session in there. Obviously, under the covers, that file in core will use something called REST API, which is a TypeScript library to pull that in. But yeah, you can just define, here's my code which knows, TypeScript code which knows how to talk to the REST API. You can define TypeScript objects for your JSON responses, etc. Yeah. And then you just pull them in via that. So that. That's generating a CLI directly from our own REST API. Yes. So how would we do it through the mediation there? So we, we, we run out of time. But it, it, it really, I'll, I'll rattle through it, thanks Steve, in like literally 30 seconds. So this is the catalog of the existing ones that are there right now. There are samples available to um, onboard a REST API to the mediation layer. Um, we have samples, and the one that's probably most interesting is REST APIs without code changes required. Um, and basically to get, to get you on board. And the, effectively there's a YAML file um, which you have to create. And we've got, you go to zoe.org documentation or just ask us a question. But that's what we're, and, and the YAML file effectively wires together your REST API 
and effectively introduces it to the gateway. And then what you do is you'll, you'll get, I don't know if I've got a screenshot of the tile. Anyway, you'll get a tile here with your API. And then when you click up on that tile, it'll take you to another, you know, more, more larger one that says, okay, more interesting information about you and you connect to the documentation and you, you connect to where the swagger is hosted and so forth. Are we done, Keith? Yeah. Um, well, what I'd like to do, because this is the application development stream, and so thank you, Joe, for instance, just talking about what Zoe is. But let's bring it back to what is Zoe, or how could you use Zoe in an application DevOps environment? You know, you already have, you have a number of products and a number of vendors doing various things, helping you. And if you go back to what Joe said right at the beginning, this is open source. Yeah? We are, we as a community within Zoe, this is not just IBM, this is the, the community have identified that, that the platform, the Z platform, <coughs> is a strategic piece of kit, not ZOS, strategic piece of kit, that is going to be around for a long time. We have got to make it, use whatever words you want to use, for the young people coming in. They do not want to see green screens. So this is a mechanism which is going to enable a rapid deployment of new ideas built upon old, I'm going to use the word old, strategic, without having to change it. The risk of an organization to go back and change what's been in there 10, 20, 30 years is too expensive. If it was that easy, there wouldn't be a mainframe today. So what Zoe's doing from an application perspective is when you look at your application, you'll look at how applications are not a Z-based application. They are an application driving business running across multiple platforms. More and more of that is going to API and REST APIs. People are looking at their COBOL 2, COBOL 3, COBOL 5, and COBOL 6. What's COBOL 6 got in it? It's got direct REST calls in it. You go to Swagger, see now you're looking at the Swagger. What Zoe is bringing that interface to you or to the community so you can apply your REST, your API calls. You don't actually have to go and buy a product because this is actually free, this is open source. So now you can very easily address and bring into your DevOps strategy an architectural platform to initially limp what you've got and bring new energized blood to the table. <coughs> so that's where I personally see the value of Zoe. And Zoe today will be totally different to Zoe next week. Right? So, so to Keith's point, one interesting question, and I, I was, we always struggle with this within IBM, is, is if you talk about application development, should we focus on making COBOL and PL1 more consumable for people under 45? Or should we just go all out with like Java and Swift and Node and things like that? And I, I never, and, and I, I switch back and forth, right? I mean, the money trail leads to COBOL and PL1, right? Um, and, but if you're, if you're looking forward to like 15 years or something like that, it's probably more, there's probably, you know, more Java and more Node and Swift and other, other languages and things like that. And, um, and, you know, they have their own way of working and, I don't know what people think, but I'm, I'd be curious, because that's, I don't know what, to be successful, we have to do both, but I don't know what people think. I think you want to be decomposing the legacy code into manageable chunks and slowly re-engineering it in new languages, so you have this patchwork quilt that you can sort of gradually replace the mission critical pieces with that stuff that's in a different language, perhaps, and people want to share that. That's a good point. So I do see customers moving you know, refactoring COBOL applications, taking out the really, really high volume, very expensive because you pay monthly license charge through IBM for COBOL, to Java because you don't pay monthly license charge and it's because it's a different, you know, uh, you know, you can get Java developers coming out of the university and things like that. So yeah, that's a good point, yeah. So we have to keep that. With my uh, uh, rules engine hat on, um, we, we have tools that allow you to, to, to do that. So we have COBOL applications instead of having the decision logic
I think. Okay, can I just turn up? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is one of the sessions which I was pleased to get the offer from the Zoe community. When I've been saying to other people who are very strange, what I would like each and every one of you is to think about what you've heard. I'm not saying go out and use it, but think out the box. <laughs> because if you think within the box, this won't work. So you think about what you want to do. Think, take, take a step out of the box and look into the, the box. And if you can come away with one item that you can then turn into your own little project, then this has been successful. And you can apply that. It's a thought-provoking session. It's not the panacea to help their box. It is something that will get you potentially to where you would like to go. So on that, from a GSC perspective, <coughs> Joe, very much for, for introducing Zoe to this community group. We will be running other groups next year, so the AB will be running what I'm going to be calling two field organisation, two field seminars, probably one in the north, one in the south, and they're probably one day, maybe two days, around applications development from a mainframe to enterprise. Yeah? So this is DevOps enterprise management. So you'll see, we'll have another update from Zoe. Where is Zoe? What's it happening? We'll have updates from other areas. But we are going to the market. Like GSE is coming to you, the market. That's quite a big shift that we're trying to achieve with the AD. So from this, <coughs> thank you very much, Joe. And thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you.